Welcome to today's research seminar at the Institute for Future Studies. Today I am sharing, I'm Ludwig Beckmann, professor in political science and a researcher here at the Institute. And our today's, today's guest is Jan Tyrell from Stockholm University. Jan Tyrell is the uh, Lars Johan Hjerta Chair Professor at, Stock, at the Department of Politics at Stockholm University. He has previously been professor at Lund, at Lund University. He took his PhD from uh, Uppsala University in 1998. And he has served as a project coordinator for the Quality of Government Institute in Gothenburg University. He's also been one of the founding members of the Varieties of Democracy together with Stefan Lindberg in Gothenburg. He is the author of many books and articles in, um, uh, in uh, political science, among them The Determinants of Democratization, Explaining Regime Change, Regime Change in the World, 1972 to 2006. We are very happy to uh, uh, welcome, in, yeah, welcome John here today. And he will speak about Commitments and Bargaining Delays in Parliamentary Democracies. And just a practical matter that I will uh, inform the audiences of before we start, and that is that it is possible to ask questions during the lecture in the chat. And uh, I will then, if you have a question that you want to ask during the lecture, uh, we will take notice of that and may ask John during the lecture of that question. Otherwise, we will have a Q&A uh, following the the, um, the talk. Questions of clarification only. Yes, questions of clarification, yeah. of course. Yeah. The, the main discussion will be following after the talk. Perfect. So thank you, Jan. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's really good to be here. Um, I just wanted to say a few words first about the background uh, of this presentation. So what I'm going to present to you today is the paper version of a book uh, that came out in Swedish in the fall of uh, 2020. Um, that was called 134 dagar om regeringsbildningen efter valet 2018. Because what happened after the election in 2018 was that we had an unusually prolonged government formation process in Sweden. Typically it takes like 19 days at most to form a government in Sweden. This time it took 134 days. Uh, and this made the Speaker of the Parliament uh, initiate a study to conduct some kind of uh, experience collection uh, uh, exercise. And that was then funded by Riksbankens Jubileumsfond. Uh, and I was commissioned together with three co-authors that you also see on the screen here uh, to, to, to study this government formation process and write a book on it. Uh, and uh, uh, this, as I said, is then an article version coming out of this book. So a lot of things are in this book that, of course, uh, cannot come through uh, in this article. And in the book, we both studied this formation process in Sweden, but we also compare it to other similar processes in other uh, Western European countries going back to World War II. Uh, and we also do historical comparisons with previous government formation process in Sweden. Uh, the latter part will not be part of my presentation, but the first two will. So uh, together with Hanna Beck, Johan Hellström and Johannes Lindvall, um, this is what I'm going to present to you. And the background is not only Swedish. So we had a, an unusually prolonged government formation process in Sweden in 2018. But this is actually, as you can see here on the slide, part of a more general trend. So if we look at 17 parliamentary uh, democracies in Sweden, uh, sorry, in Europe, some, some ba day back in the 50s, you know, you, you, uh, in the average number of days it took to form a government. And usually the way this is counting is how many days after the election does the new government uh, actually take office. It took some 20, 25 days. This was then increasing up until about the 80s where it leveled off at around 40 days. But then it has been on the increase again since. And it's still on the increase. And we still see uh, uh, records when it comes to government formation processes around the world. So the Netherlands, for example, had, had its record now in 2019. It took almost a year to form a new government uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so this is something uh, that sort of attracted our uh, attention and curiosity. Why is this the case? Why does it become more and more complicated to form governments in uh, Western European parliamentary democracies? And of course, there's huge variation in terms of how long it takes. So what you just looked at was the averages over time. 
here is just the distribution and as you can see some of these processes are extremely short whereas some are really really long the r the the red uh, bar there that's the swedish one just to s look at it in a comparative perspective uh, the longest one the record there to the furthest to the right is 541 days that's w the world record considered to be held by belgium and that's how long it took for them to form a government after the election in 2010 so that's a long time as you can imagine one and a half years um, and the literature trying to understand this variation has previously focused on two different factors uh, one is called preference uncertainty and the other is called bargaining complexity and i'll come back to these uh, at later time points in the during presentation but just read briefly preference uncertainty that's the idea that the actors the parties that have to negotiate over who is going to join the government if they don't know anything about each other's preferences basically where are the limits to what you can sort of agree to or not agree to that makes it more complicated to form a government the other thing has more to do with the complexity of the situation as such basically how many actors are involved how many different kinds or types of government can you actually form under any specific uh, circumstance so it's a function mostly of the number of parties but it's not only that simple empirically the focus has been on things such as comparing government formation processes occurring after an election and in between an election and that has then been the proxy for preference uncertainty not a very uh, uh, precise one but also things such as party system fragmentation that's basically not only how many parties are there but how big are the parties so the more and the smaller parties you have the more fragmented a party system you have and the longer it usually takes ideological polarization so that's basically the more apart the, pol the parties are in the policy space the more difficult it becomes to form a government and also as another sort of aspect of that the size of extreme parties where by extreme parties we mean sort of in the olden days the communist parties and nowadays uh, populist right-wing parties the bigger they become the longer it tends to take there is however not only variation if you just compare processes like this but if you compare countries they're actually pretty huge differences so these are the averages uh, in terms of how many days it has taken to form a government in these 17 countries going back to world war ii and maybe all no the the labels here are not visible for you but there is a group here that is really sort of standing out in terms of regularly having a long government formation process and that's the netherlands austria and belgium so there it's not uncommon it's rather sort of the the, the common practice that it takes around two months or more uh, to form a government whereas on the other hand here we have the united kingdom and we also have systems like greece and france where it usually takes 10 days or less and sweden still even if we count the long process we had in 2018 falls to the lower end here so usually it doesn't take that long as i said a standard has been since 1974 when we got our new constitution 19 days the average is a little little higher than that so this has of course then made people think about are the institutional differences between countries that can explain these huge country differences and two things have come to the fore there one <coughs> focuses on investiture rules and what this is about is when you form a government does the legislator the parliament has to vote about that or not sometimes it has to vote in some countries it does not have to vote and when it has to vote there are different decision rules does you have do you have to have a majority behind the decision to form a government or is it okay uh, with only a minority uh, or rather not having a majority against as in the swedish system that i'll come back to another factor that has been played in here is semi-presidential do you have a directly elected president for example like Fra like in france that has tended to to uh, speed up these processes so what we want to do here is that we want to sort of combine some of these more longer term structural changes if you like having to do with the development of the party system for example uh, um, with more medium term party strategic choices having to do with things such as do you uh, um, um, do you join an, a pre-electoral alliance or not for example 
So we want to combine these two kinds of factors in our effort to understand this variation. And here we make <coughs> a theoretical contribution, because besides those two mechanisms that the previous literature has focused on, preference uncertainty and bargaining complexity, we think it's really important <coughs> to focus on commitment problems. And I'll explain going forward here uh, more clearly what that is about, but basically even if you know exactly what the other parties that you're bargaining with want, it can be really difficult to strike a deal. Because even if you can strike a deal now about what, what is this government going to be about, who is going to be in it, and what, uh, what is our program, you have to trust that this actually is going to carry it out afterwards. And that's the commitment problem here. Particularly if some of the bargaining parties are not going to join the government, but they are going to be outside the government just supporting its formation. So I'll come back to this, but that's just really, really, really in brief words what this third theoretical mechanism is about. And we do this with what we in political science call, science call the mixed methods design. So we both do a statistical study of all the government formation processes that we think fit sort of some basic criteria uh, in the 17 uh, democracies going back to 1945 and a detailed case study of the Swedish case of 2018. And I'm going to focus on the latter here, uh, maybe because that's what I found most intriguing myself, but also because that's actually the bulk of the paper. And we develop three hypotheses going forward. So the first thing is this about a pre-electoral alliance. This is a factor that has been looked at in previous literature, but more like a side factor, a control variable, if you like. But if you think about what a pre-electoral alliance is, that is basically some parties saying that if we win this government, we will form, uh, sorry, if we win this election, we will form the government together. And it's pretty easy to uh, imagine that that could help speed up the government formation process. Basically what happens is that if such a pre-electoral alliance of parties do gain a majority in particular, that basically means that Probably they have already negotiated before the election, more or less, how they're going to divide up the portfolios in the government, you know, who's getting what ministry, what kind of policies do they want to pursue. They know each other fairly well, so, so they can trust each other. So basically all the thing, these things, it's, it's a less complex process, it's this, there's less preference uncertainty, and there are fewer commitment problems. All this speaks in favor that we should see that if we have a pre-electoral alliance that actually gets a, a, a majority, it should be much faster to form a government. Secondly, this goes back to a factor that I mentioned previously, but that I haven't sort of really been taken that seriously, and that is this thing about extreme parties. What is it about extreme parties that can complicate, because that's our argument, the government formation process? Well, basically we think that this has to do with former alliances that have to be broken up or former, not only alliances, but forms of cooperation between parties that has, been that has to be broken up because of these, uh, these new parties. These new parties, and now I'm particularly thinking about the, the, the populist right-wing parties nowadays, but you can think about it in terms of communist parties growing really big uh, back in the days. These parties are typically, <coughs> in one way or another, pariah parties. The other parties don't want to have them in the government. Uh, and one could imagine that that would sort of facilitate, make it easier to form a government because it makes the situation a little less complex. So if these are big, so then we can just, you know, sort, s take them out of the equation. But we argue that it's not that easy because what they create is a lot of preference uncertainty among the remaining parties uh, about what they actually want to do and how they want to deal with these new parties. So our argument is that this should make uh, government formation process take longer time. Finally, <coughs> and this goes to the core of uh, uh, basically an underlying bargaining model that we are all, or, all, the, all the time thinking about here. If you think about the parties that have to sit down and agree whether they should form the government or not, as I mentioned, there could be uncertainty uh, on what the other parties want, and there could be commitment problems, basically distrust. Both these factors should be reduced if these parties have cooperated before. So if this is a 
old gang of friends that has been in government several times and ev mo mo more important so in recent history well then you basically know each other then you know each other's uh, uh, preferences and you also <coughs> can trust that the others will will uh, uh, will we'll keep their promises when in government. So we argue that this familiarity among the parties, we can only measure that in the whole party system though, uh, should reduce the number of days it takes to form a government. And now I'll talk <coughs> fairly quickly about the statistical results. And I'm just going to skip straight through to the results. This is <coughs> the uh, uh, coefficients from a so-called negative bi binomial regression. So you can think about it as a normal regression. It's just that it has a very particular distribution. Since these days it takes to form a government, uh, um, well, they cannot take negative values, for example, and they, th they tend to, be <coughs> to have some high extreme values and things like that. It doesn't really matter what kind of statistical model we, we, uh, we throw at this, uh, but this is the one that is considered the most uh, valuable one in the literature. So some things here that we don't focus on, but are more sort of uh, background factors. So if a government formation process happens after an election, not in between elections, it's, it's <coughs> it much longer. So positive coefficient here means it takes much longer to form a government. Negative, it's shorter. It's also the fact that party fragmentation, so that's basically the number of parties and their size to get taken together. The more fragmented the party system is, the longer it takes. Another pretty obvious thing, uh, if there is sort of a clear, I if one party gains the majority of the seats in the legislature, so we have a so-called majority situation, that typically makes it very easy to form a government because that party forms the government. So here, when we control for that, we can see that if that is not the case, it usually takes uh, longer. <coughs> Things like that. Focusing our, on our hypothesis, however, there are two things which we get support for. So first, this idea that the extreme party seat share makes it more complicated to form a government. So you have a positive and a statistically significant coefficient for that. And this familiarity thing. So this is a, like a measure of uh, the extent to which the parties that are now in the legislature have together cooperated in the government before taking into account how long ago it was. And with this measure, we can actually see that the more familiar the parties are with each other, the shorter the duration of the government formation process. We do not, however, and we have, and I can tell you, we are a little bit struggling with this, find evidence for this pretty obvious thing that if you have a pre-electoral coalition, that's what a PEC is, that gains a majority, that gets more than 50% of the seat, <coughs> yes, the size, uh, the sign of the coefficient is the right one. So it looks like it's 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 a shorter duration, but the f the confidence interval is really wide. So it's not statistically significant. Um, we have some ideas. We can com come back to that in the Q and A why why this is the case. Um, but uh, we don't get support for this pretty. We think uh, or we thought uh <coughs> obvious hypothesis. So what? we do now then is that we turn from the statistical results to the case of Sweden. Um, so what we're going to do in the case of Sweden is that we're going to see whether some of the sort of <coughs> other uh, observable implications of these hypotheses having to do with extreme party seat share and familiarity sort of play out in the Swedish case the way you would have uh, expected them to if this hypothesis is right. So not only relying on statistical evidence but on what we call causal process evidence. But we will also dig into <coughs> this thing about a pre-electoral -elec coalition, more specifically one that does not get, um, get a majority and how that can actually affect the government formation process. So trying to link these statistical results to um, the Swedish case. And I will not go into depth about how we form governments in Sweden. So. Uh, this is just basically a refresher. Everybody who, uh, who uh, follows Swedish politics got many of these refreshers after the last election because it was so complicated, but here is one anyway. In Sweden, <coughs> this process either starts with the, gov uh, the prime, prime minister resigning. He could resign or he she could resign after an election or in between elections. Or if the prime minister does not resign, we have a compulsory vote of confidence 
after the election. And if the prime minister doesn't pass this vote, then the whole process in is initiated. And the one who leads this process in the Swedish system, and that's unique feature to Sweden, is the Speaker of the Parliament. In other systems, it's usually the head of state, so either the president or the monarch. Uh, but in Sweden, it's the Speaker of the Parliament for historical reasons we can talk about in the Q&A if you're interested. <coughs> so, and the role of the Speaker of the Parliament is just to nominate one candidate for the prime minister post. And then we have this investiture vote in Sweden. So the speaker cannot appoint the prime minister, but only nominate it. And the legislator, the, the par Swedish parliament, has to vote on it. But with a particular decision rule, with a so-called negative decision rule. So this nominated candidate passes if there is not the majority voting against, and a majority in terms of, of all um, members of parliament, not only in terms of the, those who vote. If <coughs> this candidate is rejected, this process is repeated four times. And if on the fourth uh, vote uh, the, the candidate is rejected, we go back to the, uh, the voters and there is a re-election, although this has never happened in Sweden. So base some basic facts about the electoral results, just a refresher on this too, if you don't remember. So in government at the time were the Social Democrats and the Green Party, <coughs> they got together some 33.2% of the seats after the election, but they also had a collaboration with the left party, and this was then called the Red-Green Bloc. What is the Red-Green Bloc today? That's a more difficult question that I will not talk about during this presentation. And on the other side was these four center-right parties that had working together in the so-called Alliance for Sweden, or going all the way back to 2004, actually. <coughs> and as you can see here, the red-green bloc, they had a little... Le uh, um, th um, they had actually one more seat than the Alliance for Sweden, and this turned out to be really critical for this process. And then the Sweden Democrats, which is not <coughs> and or was not part of any of these alliances, got 17.8%. And the process, <coughs> again, I won't go into detail, Real brief <coughs> is the election day was on September 9. A little bit more than two weeks later, uh, Parliament summoned and held this compulsory vote of confidence for the Prime Minister, which he did not pass. The Prime Minister at the time was Stefan Löfven. Um, so here the process sort of from the perspective of the, the, the uh, Speaker of the House initiated. He first nominated <coughs> Ulf Kristersson, who was the party leader, is the party leader still of the Conservative Party. Thank you. Um, who was rejected in this vote? So more than a majority. So he he did not. Uh, more than a majority of the, those voting basically rejected him. In December, so one month later, there was another nomination, and this time it was Stefan Löfven, the incumbent prime minister, who was proposed, and he was also rejected. Then after <coughs> another round of elections, uh, sorry, negotiations in, in January, um, something called the January Agreement was formed between two of the former alliance parties, that's the Centre Party and the Liberal Party, and the two government parties, Social Democrats and the Green Party. And this time Stefan Löfven passed the vote. So on January 21, in this formal process at Stockholm Castle, uh, which was 134 days after the election, we got a new government in Sweden. And the first thing we do in connecting the statistical results to the Swedish case is just that we see what happens if we use this model and try to predict how many days, if this model is right, do we expect it to take to form a government in Sweden. And here one should bear in mind that we only look at variation within countries in this model. So basically, we have a dummy for all the countries, so we can really predict the average level for each country well. But that's just cheating, if you like. So that's not part of, of uh, uh, how well this model performs. So what's interesting is rather how well does it perform within countries over time in predicting the number of days. So this is the prediction. That's the line here, you see. And the circles here, that's how many days it actually took. <coughs> and this goes back to 1974, since that's when we got these rules. 
And as I mentioned to you, typically it takes around 19 days to form a government in Sweden, where we have a government formation process. That's actually what it took in 2014 too. According to our model, well, it should have taken a little longer, but it fares, you know, as you can see, fairly well in explaining this sort of uh, this low number of days that it should take to form a government in Sweden. And it also picks up an upward trend towards the end here. And this has mostly to do with the entry of the Sweden Democrats in the election of 2010, because then we get a more fragmented party system and larger seat share for extreme parties. So. Yes, this model works in the sense that it predicts that it should take longer today to form a government in Sweden than it did back in the days. But it, as you can see, it overshoots pretty heavily the number of days it should have taken to form a government in 2014. And more critical for our case study here, it seriously undershoots the number of days it actually took to form a government in Sweden in 2018. According to this model, it should have been like 48 days. So yes, there is some part of this sort of structural model that can help us explain the Swedish case, but no, not to the full extent. So we need to go into more detailed case study evidence here. Um, how am I doing on time? Because I didn't look what time it was when I started. Have I done like 20 minutes or? Yeah, you talked about 20, 25 minutes. So. Good. Okay, there's a follow-up here. Oh, what sure. Just so yes, please. The, the model prediction here, uh, can you just remind me again, what is it based on? Is it you put Sweden in a certain cohort, or is it, and then Sorry, compared it's with a certain cohort of similar countries? Yes, so it's 17 countries, wi uh, with all, all their government formation processes going back to 1945. But but not uh, in sort of like for like, so to speak. So it's Sweden compared to all the 17, even though they're very different. Yes. Um, but oh, with okay. country dummies, so country okay. fixed effects. Okay. So everything that sort of uh, is institutionally different between the countries, we just take out of the picture. So we only oh, focus on variation over time within the countries. Okay. Okay. And the predictions are about the number of days. We can sort of tease that out of the model. <coughs> and the, one the way we go about this in the case study is that we argue that in order to understand why it took so extremely long to form a government in Sweden after 2018, we have to focus on two, two critical junctures, ba basically uh, <coughs> junctures along the way where the process could have ended. And it's pretty easy just looking at the institutional structure what those two junctures were, namely the two rejected candidates. So the vote for Ulf Kristersson on November 14 and the vote, the f the, I mean the failed vote for uh, Stefan Löfven on December 14. If he had passed here, well, as yes, you can imagine, the, the process would have only have lasted like some 40 days, and here some 70 days, or it's a little bit more actually. Um, so um, the question we ask is why Ulf Kristersson, party leader of the, uh, of the uh, Conservative Party, did not pass here, and why Stefan Löfven did not pass here. And one can translate the first question basically to this. <coughs> He didn't pass because those two parties, the Center Party and the Liberal Party, that was former part of his alliance, they voted against him. And they did that because they did not want a government in Sweden that was indirectly dependent on the votes of the Sweden Democrats. So that the Sweden Democrats, their votes weren't in themselves uh, important for this process, <coughs> but um, they had to abstain in order for uh, Ulf Kristersson to pass. Either abstain or vote for him. And if his government would have formed, that that would be in a government between the, uh, the, the um, conservatives and the uh, Christian Democrats, his budget would have to pass, uh, relying on the Sweden Democrats. So this is something that the Center Party and the Liberal Party did not want. But they know that all along. They had said that already in the election campaign that we don't want a government in Sweden that is indirectly have to rely on the votes of the Sweden Democrats. So that was no news on November 14. And if they knew that all along, why didn't they just start bargaining, negotiating with the Social Democrats and the Green Party already after election night? Or it actually this time it took three days before election results were clear. But I mean in September. Then we could have uh, got a September agreement instead, not instead of this January agreement. And it was actually taken zero days to form a government in Sweden because basically Stefan Löfven could just have, he, he would have even have won the, the, the vote of no confidence. 
Why did that not happen? That's the first question we try to answer with this case study. <coughs> so here in December, what happens is that there is a first bargaining round between those four parties, the center party, the liberals, the greens and the social democrats, but it fails. So there actually was five days of tough negotiations, but the center party in the end said that, no, we cannot accept this. And that is why Stefan Levien is voted out, uh, not voted out of office, but that's why his nomination is, does not pass in December. So here the question is, why this, did these negotiations in Nov December break down? And basically this is about the explaining the what the center party did. So those are the two things I'm going to focus here in my presentation of the case study. And the simple answer to the first question here, why didn't the Center Party and the Liberals just start bargaining with the Social Democrats and the Green Party already in September, is this pre-electoral coalition called the Alliance. And it's, one can also say it's a pre-electoral commitment. They had promised their voters to try to form a government together, so it wasn't that easy to just back out of that agreement. Um, but it ends up with a splinter. So in the end, this is the party leader for the Center Party and this was the former leader of the Liberal Party. They move on to support the, uh, the Social Democratic and Green uh, government instead, whereas these two guys are sidelined. In more theoretical terms, this is a pre-electoral uh, coalition without its re required majority. And it's important to understand that um, what the majority has to mean here varies a little bit by, s by system. So if, if you're required to have a majority for the government, for example, then this pre-electoral coalition has to have more than 50% of the seats to be a majority. But if you only have to avoid having a majority against you, it's more the relative majority that is important here. And as I told you, this relative majority was against the alliance. So they had one seat less than the red-green parties. Had they had one seat more, basically they could just have said that then we're not, we're not dependent on the Sweden Democrats in order to form this government, to get the budget through and so on and so forth, then they would have formed the government. We're not ex trying to explain the election results though, but given that election results, what happened? Well, what happens was that <coughs> these parties suddenly have to make, take a new stand on how, how are we going to s view the, the, the question of who is going to be in government. And that was an easy process for, the, for the, uh, um, the Conservative Party and the Christian Democratic Party, but it was a really difficult process for these two parties. It was a really difficult process for, se for several reasons. Strategically, if we just shift sides now, how, how, how much are we going to lose in terms of vo uh, future votes? They were extremely divided internally, so there were very, very different views on this, and the division looked a little bit different in the two, two parties. But basically what happens was that there was some kind of preference uncertainty here, but not about wha where the other parties were, but inside the parties themselves, and particularly in these two parties. And that started an intra-party bargaining process that was really complicated, and that was handled sometime around the late, late November or something like that. And that's when they then could start bargaining with, with the Social Democrats, but not until then. So there was a bargaining delay due to this. Secondly, <coughs> one can also see this in terms of the other hypothesis focusing on what happens with a large uh, uh, extreme party and where the support is also growing. So what this meant was basically that, and that's what was the theoretical idea too, that former ways of cooperating and what the, the sent, sorry, the, the uh, um, the populist right-wing party do is that they p particularly splinter former cooperations between center-right parties, whereas the communist parties back in the days, they, they particularly splintered s cooperations between social democrats and, and, uh, uh, and, and parties more to the left. But speaking of today's processes and the Swedish process, this created a huge conflict because basically what did they disagree about? Why was the Sweden Democrats such a problem, su such a big problem? One can see this in two ways. One is the strategic way. So these two parties, they make another strategic calculus on how much they would actually lose in terms of votes by cooperating with 
uh, or, or forming a government that was dependent on the Sweden Democrats. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric surrounding that, but that's sort of, when you boil down to it, that's the main strategic reason. But you can also see it just in policy terms. These two parties, when it comes to those issues that are important for the Sweden Democrats, they're usually called Galtan issues, so th things having to do with Sweden about uh, being tough on crime, um, uh, the view on, uh, on immigration, the view on integration, they are much... They, these two parties are much closer to the Sweden Democrats and were already then than these two parties. So there is a policy divide here. So you don't have to see this only in strategic terms. There is also actually a policy divide. And these parties also are, were splintered inside in terms of those two policy divides. And that's basically, we can actually show, we have some data on how the, the liberal uh, party caucus in the parliament voted. Because we know each individual, what, what stand they took on in terms of the government. And the ones who voted for the Conservative Party leader and against then the, the January Agreement and all that, they are basically more, to, more, more similar to the Sweden Democrats in their policy views. But it doesn't really matter whether we explain this in strategic or policy-wise terms. <coughs> it's this conflict that again creates a preference uncertainty among these parties that creates a bargaining delay. Final step of the process. So why did these negotiations then br break down? Because if they had not breaking that broken down, we would have had some kind of, we had probably would have a government around Lucia in, in, in December. So some 90 days maybe government formation process, not 134. And they really sat down and tried hard, five days and nights, uh, in, in, in complete sort of uh, uh, seclusion. Nobody knew they were bargaining. Not a single journalist knew that they were bargaining. There was not a single news uh, article about this during the time. But they failed. So why did they fail? So here, here I'm just going back to this theoretical bargaining model that I talked about before. So if you just think about two parties bargaining about something that is on a continuous policy space. <coughs> Both, of course, want the outcome to be as close to their position as possible. So A wants the outcome to be here, and B wants the outcome to come to be there. Um, if you like, you can think about this as Russia and this as Ukraine, actually, because that's where this model comes from. It comes from trying to understand the international conflict, but no parallels whatsoever uh, uh, apart from that. Both, we can see, have some kind of reservation point. So any kind of deal that is further away than this, A will not uh, go, uh, go with. Any agreement that is further down than here, B will not go with. So this first makes it pretty obvious that if you know where the other's reservation points are, well, then you can immediately hone in on this part of the outcome. And you can basically try to find where in that space you're going to locate the, the, uh, the outcome. So that makes it much, much easier to, to come to, to, uh, to an agreement. Or if you reverse that, if you don't know where these reservation points are, well, then you have this preference uncertainty, and that can cause a prolonged uh, bargaining or even bargaining failure. But even if you know that, even if you have bargained to the position that you actually know each other's reservation point, and you find a solution somewhere here, you have to trust that that solution is actually going to be carried out tomorrow. That's a deal you make now. How can you actually trust that it's going to be carried out tomorrow? And this is the commitment problem. <coughs> so if you cannot trust that, basically, if the party who's going to carry this out cannot commit to not renege or, or you know, break the promises, uh, then the other party cannot uh, accept this agreement. And this is pretty much what was going on in this process. So what we do here in the case study is that we compare the process leading up to the December agreement, which was never called the December agreement because it was never published and nobody ever talked about it because it was rejected by the center party. But we got hold of a copy of it and we started the process. We compare that with the January agreement, which everybody knows, everybody read many times uh, because it was ac accepted by the center party. Of course, not only by the center party, but by all the parties. But since they were the ones who rejected this process, th this, this agreement, that's why we make that comparison. <coughs> these processes are very similar in many other ways. They took about five days, these bargainings and these. They were in total seclusion, as I said. 
more or less between the same people. There were some differences, uh, but sort of more on the margin and, and, and none that we think were really important. Uh, but the center party rejected this, but agreed to this. And why was that the case? Well, if you look at the process, there's so much uh, preference uncertainty and commitment problems going on here. When it comes to the preference uncertainty, it's just very visual in the way they try to signal to each other. Just one example, I don't have to time to go into detail. How does this bargaining process start? Well, it starts by the center party giving an interview to Dagens Nyheter about the exact demands that the Social Democrats have to fulfill in order for the center party to accept a, a Social Democratic government. So it's not even a, uh, a they're not even talking to each other. She gives an interview to the public about this. That's how the whole thing starts. The Social Democrats try to respond, and she says on the same day as they actually start bargaining that, uh, um, in I don't exact remember the exact word now, but uh, basically that we, we, we cannot trust that they want to go forward with this. So there's so many problems, and now I say it from the perspective of the Center Party. The Social Democrats, they're also absolutely certain that the Center Party, they are only there to be able to tell the public that, yeah, we tried to, to bargain with the Social Democrats, we never wanted to, so we're going to go with Ulf Kristersson. They don't trust the Center Party to be serious either. So there's serious uh, uncertainty problems, preference uncertainty problems, but even when they start to get resolved, there are, I would say, even more important commitment problems. Because if you look at the contents of these two agreements, they're not that different, actually. So this was famous first as the 73-point program, because it was 73 policy points. It's a long program. Well, this had 66 points. If you look at the contents of the most contentious issues, having to do with the, with the labor market reforms and the housing price, uh, uh, housing um, uh, reforms, they are not that different actually. The biggest difference is that everything here has a very, very explicit timeline. So here it says that we are first going to have a government commission and that's going to be done on that date and then we are going to have a government bill and that's going to come in this date and then the reform will carry it out in this or that date. And that, in our view, is about overcoming this commitment problem. So the Center Party got guarantees here that they wouldn't be tricked by the Social Democrats once they were in government and the Center Party was not. So essentially we're arguing that in theoretical terms again, this lack of familiarity. These parties had not bargained before, or at least not for a long time, and particularly not in that, that four-party position. That lack of uh, familiarity both caused preference uncertainty and commitment problems, which called this caused this bargaining delay. And this is fairly well illustrated if you listen to what the Center Party leader Anne Lev says, not in January, that's the, 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 the talk everybody has cited, but in December when she rejects the so-called December agreement, that's our name, it was never called that, she says this, S, that's the Social Democrats, has not been able to be sufficiently precise in terms of labor market and housing market reforms. The wording that is this may look beautiful, but it's vague and imprecise. They try to bury quite a lot in government commissions and postpone specifying timetables to the future. So here, afterwards, not that much preference uncertainty anymore, but the commitment problems definitely are there. Interestingly, and tying back to our other explanatory factors, she also makes a comparison to how she's used to bargain within the Alliance for Sweden with the Christ Christian Democrats and the Conservatives. Me and the Center Party, we are used to the constructive culture of cooperation that we had and, with <coughs> and have had within the Alliance. But in these sharp negotiations with the Social Democrats, it has become clear that the Social Democrats are used to a completely different kind of cooperation where they are in the driver's seat and other parties are just compliments. So, to conclude, in this paper we find statistical evidence in support for two of our, hy of our hypotheses. So, it takes longer to form a government when extreme parties hold a larger seat share, and it takes shorter when parties have more recent experience of working together in government, that is familiarity. Case study evidence from Sweden sort of underpins the, the mechanisms, if you like, for, for A and B here. But uh, in addition, it shows that there is something with these pre-electoral coalitions that under some circumstances actually can make them <coughs> create longer bargaining duration. Uh, and we, our, our idea was that that was just because they did not get a majority, but the, sti the, sti 
statistical results say that there's something more going on there because we don't get statistical support even for the pre-electoral coalitions with the majority, um, as you may recall. They, they, they are not statistically significant, if, uh, significant effect of that. And finally, this thing about commitment problems, which we think are a third important generic mechanism for understanding these processes. And with that, I end. Thank you so much, Jan. That was a very interesting yeah. talk. We are now opening the Q&A session. And uh, note that I'm telling this to everyone that the first ha half hour of this Q&A session will be recorded. We will use the chat function to run the Q&A, and if you wish to ask a question, you should write it in the chat. As we are a mix of researchers from different fields, we ask you to tell us your area of study so that we can ensure that we take questions from different disciplines. So write your name and area of study when you post your question. And if there is a question that you want to follow up on, you can write follow up to that particular person you want to follow up to. Uh, when it's your turn to ask your question, we will call upon you and you will then put will be put in the spotlight so that your video and sound becomes available to the audience. You can then ask your question. So, what do we have? I will right away give the word to Christer. Yeah, thank you so much for that very interesting talk. Um, this is just a question of clarification, I think. It's about the distinction between sort of commitment problems and preference uncertainty. Because I thought one way you presented the commitment problem is that you're not sure whether they will actually implement it. Right? That's one uncertainty. But I think uh, the example you gave here is rather they not sure when they will implement it. And that seems to be more like an uncertainty about preference, actually. When, what, which timetable do they prefer, so to speak? They might still be committed to change, but it's unclear when they will implement. Okay, now, um, so, so the when question is basically the solution to the commitment problem for the center party here, since I from their perspective, it has to be before the next election, so before 22, before this fall. And the time, the timing thing is just a way for them to be certain that you know they have on paper, and on on paper that is public too, that it's going to happen here and here and here and here, and that's the way that they were sort of they could overcome this uh, distrust to the social democrats. So it is about uh, whether you think it's going to be implemented uh, or not. <laughs> the timing thing is just a way of also ba basically convincing them in this case that it's going to be implemented. Okay, so, so the uncertainty or the vagueness or impreciseness was about whether it actually would happen during that period. Or, or yes, rather than or when, going to be when just... When during that period it would happen. Yeah, and, and, and if, it okay. if it wasn't going to happen during that period, they didn't think it was going to happen oh, at see. all. Yeah, But I is that clear that pe people... I mean, that's one interpretation, I guess, of, of the impreciseness, but is it... The general reading of, of the documents that it was unclear whether they were, they were actually committed to do it during the period or just unclear in the about in the fir when during that period they would do it? In the first version I would say that uh -huh. there is nothing said at all about uh -huh. okay. when mm. and that to the center party sort of opened the possibility that they are just going to you know avoid doing anything mm -hmm. uh, particularly in those areas where they were most keen on having right. change right? Uh, so the the timing thing to them becomes like a problem, as I s uh, sorry, solution to the problem. No, right. Thank you. Satisfied? Yeah. Right, uh, Patrick. Thanks. Yes, this is on. So um, yeah, I I miss one factor in your model of this, um, and that's the the um, 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 the historical factor. If the, if 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 there's, for example, is. Um, if, if what usually happens in these cases in country X is that it takes a short time and you have sort of this history of we are quick at forming governments and so on. And, and if you could include uh, the time for the last three elections or something like that, uh, don't you think that would add explanation, uh, explanatory power to this model? A lag dependent variable. Yeah. It probably would. Uh, there are technical complications with doing it. Um, I think our way of thinking about it is that apart from the country fixed effects, I'm not sure it would add that much 
explanatory value because it really is that in the in the Netherlands, for example, it you know it just you're used to it taking long, but sometimes it takes unusually long. <laughs> Whereas in Sweden, we're used to it being read quick, but this very particular instant. So in the Swedish case, uh, uh, it, this jump towards the end would really go against that. So, but but yes, we could probably perf increase predictive performance of the model, but not necessarily explanatory performance. If you if by that I mean having some idea about the underlying causal mechanisms. So the, the history that is in here is this familiarity measure, because as I measured, that is sort of time-weighted. So if, if, uh, if parties cooperated like in the 90s, that's not giving, giving the same uh, weight in the measure as if they cooperated now uh, in the last uh, period. So yes, thanks. Right, thank you. Uh, Joseph. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, the microphone. Thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering a bit, uh, I'm sure you t looked into this, but like, what about uh, the uh, party discipline, especially in the parliamentary group? So if you have countries like in Italy where it's very frequent to, to, to switch. Yes, that's a good question. So um, this is now really focused on, uh, I mean, my presentation now was really focused on understanding Sweden, where party discipline is pretty strict, so so it's it's not an issue. Um, whether party discipline can also help explain the Italian case, I'm pretty sure, although one should remember here that we take away everything that is unique to Italy with these uh, country-level explanations. There are still some things that we are curious about in, in the Italian case. Uh, I hadn't thought about party discipline. That's that's a good suggestion. One thing that we have thought about is that there are uh, actually most of the cases with the pre-electoral coalition that gets a majority, but still a complicated government formation process, or in Italy. Uh, and we're not sure yet exactly what that is about, but we have a suspicion, and that is about this majority bonus system that you had in Italy. So basically some of these PECs, pre-electoral pre coalitions, are really not about we want to form the government together, but we want that bonus. <laughs> and once they got the bonus, it's a seat bonus that you get if you get the majority. Once you got the bonus, well, then you're still in a, a disagreement about who's going to form the government. But that's a suggestion that we're looking into right now, and I'm not sure. And uh, the discipline case, I'm interested. You're good? Yeah. Right. Um, so I had two questions myself, uh, or actually one question, a clarificatory question, and uh, maybe a general comment. Uh, my question was, was about the relationship between familiarity and um, commitment. It seems like they are pretty close, these variables. I mean, it's, I, I find it hard to, to really imagine how you can have a commitment problem if you have, if the familiarity condition is satisfied, and vice versa, how you can have a familiarity problem if the commitment problem is Yeah, but then solved. we're happy, because they are just a way of proxying for not S only commitment problems, but also for yeah, right. preference uncertainty. So the idea is that the more familiar you are with each other, the less preference uncertainty and the less commitment problems. So mm -hmm. commitment problems and preference uncertainty, they are the general mechanisms. Familiar familiarity is okay, empirical okay. proxy. Because these things are difficult to measure, and particularly difficult to measure sort of independently of each other. Mm. Any measure you put out there, you could sort of put under at least two of the umbrellas, uh, preference uncertainty, commitment problems, or bargaining complexity. And that's, that's been a problem in this literature already from the outset. And it's our problem too. <laughs> All right. I, mean I, I have a follow-up yeah. on, on this. So yeah. w what happens, like in the Swedish case, when parties start to switch? What, what happens to the commitment? I mean, the idea of familiarity, Yeah, this is just gone, can this be rebuilt? Uh, are you not constantly afraid, if you're moderate now, that these yeah. guys yeah. are really... Yeah. That's, that's a really good question, because it brings us to the current situation, right? Um, and we can think about how is this going to play out after the election and the fall. I'm not trying going to try to predict the election, because it's, it's such a close call. Um, but I would say that on both sides, they will have problems to form a government and, and that we can relate to these factors. So if you start on the conservative side, let's say that we get a conservative, sort of a, a, a seat majority 
for, say, the Christian Democrats, th together with the Conservatives, the Sweden Democrats, and, and the Liberals, and that the Liberals actually pass the threshold, so they will be in, in the Parliament. The Liberals are now saying that they now, they have changed back again, basically. They want to support Ulf Kristersson. And, of course, that in those negotiations will cause problems from the Conservative Party to be actually be able to trust the Liberals. But from the voters' perspective, this also creates a lot of problems because what they are hoping for now is basically a ta tactical voters. That's, you know, this, the, the Liberals, they don't say this if you ask them explicitly, but if you listen to how they argue, basically they are just hoping for strategic conservative voters who want, necessarily doesn't like this, the Liberals, but they just want them inside the parliament because then we can add those 4% seats to our government formation, uh, our, our, our government alternative. But it's really difficult to trust them. So there will be, th that will be one problem. A even bigger problem though, I would say, because it wasn't that long ago that the liberals were in the family together with the conservatives. You know, they, vote, they worked together in this alliance for Sweden for many years. Uh, so I think they can overcome that uh, commitment problem, if, if I say. The bigger problem on that side is the Sweden Democrats, because no one has bargained with them before. So no one knows where their reservation points are. And they don't know what the other reservation points are. And the, the level of distrust there is much, much bigger. Particularly if the Sweden Democrats are not going to be part of the government, and that's exactly what the conservatives don't want them to be, but in a support coalition outside of the government. So how are the Sweden Democrats going to sort of get assurances that whatever they are promised in this government for vision promise is actually going to be delivered. That's going to be a critical problem on that side. There will be problems on the other side too, however, because there we have the center party to the extent one can even say that the center party belongs to the other side because what they are now <laughs> explicit about is that they don't want to say whether they are supporting a, a, a social democratic prime minister or a conservative prime minister. But everybody, in the end, expects them to go on continuing supporting uh, the social democratic one because that's what they're doing now. Uh, so there, the big problem would be, will be uh, bargaining between the left party and the center party, both because they're policy-wise much, much further apart than I, I would say any of the four parties on the s on the uh, on the other side of, of the spectrum. Uh, but also because this, the left parties, I, they, nobody has bargained with them before about this. The Social Democrats and the Green Party, they have bargained together with the left party over the budget m several times between 2014 and 18. They know each other fairly well, although there are, you know, s their circulation on, on so th the personal factor we can take out there because we have a new party leader and so on and so forth. Um, but between the center party and the, s and the left party, this, this will be really, really difficult on the other side. And the center party probably will want to be inside the government this time. I have a hard time seeing them sort of uh, forming another January agreement and saying that we're, we're not part of the government, we're just accepting it uh, uh, if it does this or this and that. They want to be in the government themselves. And how are they going to be that without the support from the left party? <laughs> so it's going to be tricky on either side. I don't think it's going to be 134 days tricky. Uh, because we don't have that strong pre-electoral alliance as we had in the alliance. That was the main culprit of this, I would say. So 90, uh, if I may simplify it a bit, 90 of those 134 days were because of the alliance for Sweden. We don't have that now. But it could be a little bit more complicated than the 19 days we're used to. So maybe maybe a little bit more than that, but not 134 days. That's if, if, you, if you ask for my prediction, that will be it. You good? Can I? You can. <laughs> I do it. So, 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 scientifically, from political science perspective, how could could you get closer to then? Just saying, it might be like this, but it might also be like this, and we can't really. Pre I mean, do you see a way empirically to? to With the, the data uh, at hand. I mean, I, I no, just not really. Just I, just I, the, the, I, I would say if we if we would apply if we would run our model. Uh, but our model requires election results. So our model takes the election results for granted. And as I said, I'm not going to predict the election results. But let's say that opinion polls today are, are an accurate description of what's going to happen on election day. And if I would run that model and if I would try to predict the number of days it would take to form a government this fall, 
uh, I would say it would end up with something similar to what it said in 2018, 40 something. And that could be right. I have seen this data from, from Hannah Beck showed this uh, once about like um, who are you best with friends or can kind of drink a coffee with in parliament. Yep. On the could you not use that as a proxy for the commitment problem? Or but is there no difference between the liberals and the center and then? We c one could use that, if but, but that is only for one time point, so one cannot use it over time. And B, uh, that's, that's what's what she calls effective polarization. It's just another way, I, sh I would say, of, of, of saying these things that I'm saying here. <laughs> it's just another way of talking about it. Um, if, you know, sweet center parties and liberals, they don't want their, their kids to marry uh, Sweden Democrats. Sure, but what does that really tell you about the content of politics? I'm not sure. Okay. So actually, I ha my second question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you had a you had a <laughs> came into the picture. Uh, <laughs> was about your thoughts. I was curious about your thoughts about the sort of potential normative or constitutional implications of this. I mean, of yep. course, it's a very serious problem for a political system if the bargaining for bringing the government into place takes excessive time. And if that happens r repeatedly, that will in the long run probably serve to undermine confidence in the political institutions, in the political parties, and eventually in democracy itself. So I was thinking, wha wha what, what can we do about this? I mean, are there some of these rules that you mentioned, the rules of investiture, which of course are really are still already quite um, lax I in the Swedish case. Is there anything we can do to sort of avoid these? Yeah, um, great question. And now, now I turn to the book, not the paper, because that's in the book and not in the paper. And uh, actually, it's two questions. One is, does it matter? Does it matter how long it takes to form a government? And, and, and why does it matter and for what? And the second question is, is there a constitutional problem uh, rather than a political one or is there a constitutional solution mm. to the problem starting with the first um, I, I, I think when we started this study and when we started to write the book we were pretty sure that you know straight evidence will be out there that of course it's a problem um, but it's not as straightforward actually as we thought so there are some studies um, not that many that show different kinds of financial instability caused by this. So uh, instability in the financial markets. Um, but you know, they, they typically look at cases that are not as well integrated into uh, 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 an organization called the European Union as <laughs> Sweden is. And if you look at the Swedish case, there are no signs of any financial instability. We looked at this. We looked at many indicators uh, of this. Uh, and there's a very intensive uh, uh, study of this for the Belgium uh, world record process that I mentioned of 540 days, or also arguing that no harm was basically made. Everything just went on as usual. It was just the case that they had uh, uh, um, a caretaker government, not the formal government, but the caretaker government after a while just started to act like any, any regular government, and they could get things through. But I still think that, yes, if this would be repeated many times, particularly when the expectation, as it is in Sweden, is that it should be fast, it could be problematic. So I think no much harm was made in the Swedish case this time. The, the most concrete harm that one can see was basically that the whole sort of reform process, the whole government process was just, you know, it just ground to a halt. Nothing was, no, no, hardly any bills, hardly any legislative activity for a couple of months. Uh, and of course, no, that that could be seen as a problem. But they basically took took all all, all the lost time back in the in the spring semester instead. So it wasn't really that serious. But if, if it would happen again, if everybody expected to be quick, yes, then it could be problematic. But then go to the Netherlands. Nobody expected to be quick. Or listen to what they said I in Germany now after the election. Uh, they said on election night, uh, they said that we actually think we're going to be do done with this government formation process already by Christmas. And everybody was like, wow, already by Christmas, that's wonderful. Because before, in 2017, they had this even longer process. But in Sweden, if someone would say on election night, we think we're going to be done with the government formation process by Christmas, everybody would be shocked. Because everybody expected it to be done, you know, uh, 
on on 19 days at most so i'm not sure about the first one um i don't think it is as problematic at least as i thought when i when i started this because there seems to be other things that you could do to compensate for the fact that you don't have a formal government in place and the caretaker government system seemed to work really really well uh, in many many countries the constitutional thing so basically what we do there is we have an entire chapter going through all these things about the Swedish government formation process and it is a limitation but we had to do it we try to say if this rule had not been there or if we had that rule instead of this rule how would that have affected this government formation process and it's actually not much there to explain by looking at the constitutional rules so I, I would say that the thing that most people sort of point to now uh, afterwards is the fact that we have this investiture rule at all because we if, if we wouldn't have the investiture rule um, then of course everything would have been much quicker because then you know a nomination in November of Ulf Christensen would have been an appointment sure but what would have happened to that Ulf Christensen government well, the opposition would have filed a motion of no confidence immediately. So he would have been prime minister for maybe two or three days. Uh, and one can go through rule after rule. So basically we, we, we come to the conclusion that this is not a constitutional problem. I, to the extent that it is constitutional problems, you have to do much more basic things, not having to do with the government formation process as such, but if you reform the electoral system, for example. So if you put in a 10% threshold there or something like that, yes, then you get a much less fragmented party system and that will speed it up. But is that worth it? That's a pretty huge change of the way our representative system works and, and creates a lot of other problems. And if we cannot show that this is a serious, this has serious downside consequences, we're not sure that's worth it. But if the problem goes on and will be recurrent, I think that's, uh, I mean, something like that is going to go get back on the table. All right. You also mentioned that presidentialists might smoothen up the process. That might be an al alternative solution. Yes, <laughs> although I don't think <laughs> anyone wants that, but no, yes. No. <laughs> right. Um, Pontus, please. Thank you. So this is really fascinating. Thank you for a good talk. I'm wondering about both the predictive efficiency of the model. So you say that you think that what we will see is roughly what the model would predict, but how well does the model predict? Did you have any measurements like average error or or an R square for the variance? So that's the first. Uh, and the second one is, have you investigated if there's a link between the length of the process and especially to the extent that it was longer than, than predicted and to how stable that government is? So to the probability that you have to reform it again before the next election to the first question um i should have to ask my my uh my colleague you who runs all the models but my impression is that fit is poor and the only the, the only sort of reason that we get some kind of <laughs> decent fit is that we put in this country dummy so basically we just say that you know uh, taking everything that is unique to Sweden into account and to France and blah, blah, blah. Without that, um, it's, it's poor. Uh, so these are not good models. That, that's, uh, that's for a start. The second question, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so yes, there is uh, quite a few studies actually showing that the longer it takes to form a government, the longer it remains in office. Uh, and of course, that's not a deterministic relationship. There are a lot of outliers uh, to to that, but it, it's it's sort of it's it's a probabilistic statement, uh, at least, or it's a correlation. I would call it a correlation. I'm not sure it's causal at all, but it's an important correlation to think about because it actually means that it may not be that serious if it takes a long time in the beginning, because then you g at least get the same government and you get stability until the next election, um, and. In a, in a way, the parties think about it a little bit in those terms too. They were really keen on forming a government that was going to, s rem uh, I, was, I should say this, the parties that actually formed the government. So the Center Party, the Liberals, they, the way they argued, and that was a big difference from how they argued with how the Conservatives and the Christian Democrats argue, was that it's really important that if we get a government, we should 
so to be sure to have the same government as uh, until the next election. They turned out to be wrong <laughs> because, as we know, the, the, the government fell uh, last spring to, uh, to their big surprise, b maybe everybody's surprise. Uh, but that was an important argument for them. Whereas the conservatives and the Christian Democrats, they were prepared to form a government even if they weren't really sure it, it was going to last. Because you know they, were s they, s they said at this time, this was before it was an outspoken uh, policy by them to cooperate with the Sweden Democrats. At this time they just said that we're going to form the government and then we can play chicken with the Sweden Democrats and they will probably pass our budgets anyway. But they had also admitted when I interviewed them, uh, I don't think I mentioned this, but this case study is, is based on 37 interviews with all the party leaders, party secretaries and the ones involved in negotiation. So they admitted to this that yes, we know that this was going to be a, 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 a probably unstable solution. It might last for a year, it might last for two years, but if that was their strategic calculus. If a conservative government is voted out of office because of the Sweden Democrats, we are ready to face the voters because that's the first time the voters will actually have shown the true face of the Sweden Democrats. This is their strategic arguments. So they were prepared to take that risk because they thought that if the Sweden Democrats will sort of be the cause of their downfall, they would gain in that next election. You're happy, Pontus? Yeah. So, Very uh, happy. Erik. Um, you have the microphone. So first, uh, a follow-up on, uh, on Ludwig's question, I guess. To me, it seems that familiarity and commitment are quite disconnected, because one is backward-looking and one is forward-looking. Uh, one could think, I mean, familiar, I, I guess there is, Psychologically, there should be a connection, but once the landscape has changed, people will look for planning ahead for what could be my long-term partner. And if you plan to have a long-term relationship, then commitment is easier than if you think this is a one, one uh, election period um, uh, relationship, because then you know that we can we can screw each other and then go somewhere else. But that was. But then my other question was, what about pre-election commitments? Um, do they help or hinder? Because you can think they help because they, if people, if you believe that people stick with the commitments, they would reduce preferences and certainty. But if, but they could also add uncertainty about your commitment to your public commitments. Yeah, really good points. On the first, I can only agree with you, and uh, this is uh, the psychological mechanism, as you as you called it, is our sort of. That's the logic that underpins underpins why we think this measure, which is as a measure backward looking to the forward looking uh, solution to the commitment problems. But 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 in theory, I totally agree with you. Um, and yes, so the one recommendation we actually made in this book, since we didn't want to change the constitution, um, uh, that um, aggravated some was that the parties should not make these pre-electoral commitments uh, because we think that they hurt more than they sort of uh, uh, than they help and our argument behind that is that if you th if you see what our kind of system what kind of system do we have we have a system with proportional representation and what does that mean for for the way you vote it means you vote for parties you don't vote for governments. So if you want people to vote for governments, because that's typically the argument for pre-electoral commitments. So those who want the parties to say that, you know, what block do you belong to? Uh, they should either uh, want a presidential system, because that's where you actually get a vote for the government. That's what the presidential system is. They rarely want that. So instead they want these pre-electoral co uh, commitments. But we argued that, exactly as you, as you say, that they, they come with a large risk because it's so difficult after the elections to go st away from your, uh, your, your pre-electoral commitment or your promise to your voters for how you should do it or how you should not do it. So basically, uh, our, uh, our policy advice to the parties were do not make these pre-electoral commitments and to, uh, uh, to their big... Uh, uh, 
uh, annoyment, uh, we said the same to the media. Don't ask the parties for these electoral commitments. So the journalists were really pissed us at us at uh, for that, and the parties have, with one exception, completely ignored us. And the one exception is the center party, and they are not, you know, not making this pre-electoral commitment because they are they read our book, but because be they think it serves their strategic interests. So parties they do these things for strategic reasons, not because they read s books by political scientists. But I mean, every party basically uh, uh, tells their their electorates who their uh, prime ministerial candidate is, although they do it in slightly different ways. You know, very few parties do it in the way that Eva Bush does. She she says that you know Ulf Kristersson, she's she's my prime minister. Most others just you know they they uh, they express it in a way that is uh, that is clear. Um, but the center party they do not. And uh, um, how that actually will sort of play out in the election? Will that hurt them or will it help them? We we don't know. But with one party not making all the pre uh, not making the pre-electoral commitment, one could say that w I don't know. Maybe it's better if, if everybody does it or if nobody does it. <laughs> and our preference mi normatively was that nobody does it. But that's not that's not happening. That's not even near happening. So, th thank you, John, for coming here and uh, giving this nice talk. We hope to see you here again, of course, depending on your predictions, how they fall out uh, about the 40 <laughs> days negotiations of the next election. <laughs> oh, no. Did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to that. <laughs> and we have some seminars coming up soon. On March the 30th, we have uh, Mar Maria Oyala, Hope in the Face of Climate Change, Wishful Thinking or an Existential Must. On April 6th, we have Kimmo Eriksson, Social Norms and Meta Norms in 57 Countries. On April 20th, we have Sanna Folk and Leif Dahlberg, topic to be announced. See you there. Thank you all. <laughs>